later influence. How or by whom the Meditations was preserved is unknown. The late 4th century Historia Augusta paints a picture of Marcus lecturing on the Meditations to a spellbound audience at Rome, one of the charming fantasies in which that peculiar work abounds, but certainly an invention. The passage does suggest, however, that the text was in circulation by the 4th century, when it is also mentioned by the orator Themistius. It was very likely familiar also to a contemporary of Themistius's, the neo-pagan emperor Julian, known to later ages as Julian the Apostate, in whose dialogue The Caesars, Marcus is pictured as a model for the kind of philosopher king that Julian himself aspired to be. The century that followed Themistius and Julian was one of decline, at least in the West, decline in political institutions and also in the knowledge of Greek. For the next thousand years, Marcus's work, like that of Homer and Euripides, would remain unknown to Western readers. Copies survived in the Greek-speaking East, of course, but even there, the meditation seems to have been little read. For centuries, all trace of it is lost, until at the beginning of the 10th century, it reappears in a letter from the scholar and churchman Arethas, who writes to a friend, I've had for a while now a copy of the Emperor Marcus's invaluable book. It was not only old, but practically coming apart. I have had it copied and can now pass it on to posterity in better shape. Whether Aretha's copy was indeed responsible for the work's survival, we do not know. At any rate, its readership seems to have increased in the centuries that followed. It is quoted a generation or two later by the vast Byzantine encyclopedia known as the Suda, and it was perhaps around this period also that an unknown Byzantine poet composed a brief appreciation that came to be copied along with the text. On the Book of Marcus If you desire to master pain, unroll this book and read with care, and in it find abundantly a knowledge of the things that are, those that have been, and those to come. And know as well that joy and grief are nothing more than empty smoke. The fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453 led to an exodus of scholars, bringing with them the Greek texts that inspired the Italian Renaissance. The meditations must have been among them. Yet, even at this date, the work's survival hung by a thread. The only complete manuscript to survive is a 14th century codex, now in the Vatican, which is riddled with errors. The first printed edition did not appear until 1559, when Wilhelm Holtzmann, known as Zylander, produced a text from what seems to have been a more re reliable manuscript. That manuscript, unfortunately, has not survived. But even at its best, it was a very imperfect witness to what Marcus himself wrote. Our text of the Meditations contains a number of passages that are garbled or in which one or more crucial words seem to have been omitted. Some of these errors may have been due to the confused state of Marcus's original copy. Others may have been accidentally introduced in the course of copying and recopying that the work underwent in the millennium following Marcus's death. In some cases, the informed guesswork of scholars over several centuries has been able to restore the original text. In others, there is still uncertainty. The Meditations has never attracted great interest from professional students of the classics, and the reasons are perhaps understandable. It contains few direct references to historical events and provides relatively little material for social historians. As evidence for later Stoicism, it pales beside the greater bulk of Epictetus's discourses, Yet, it has always exerted a fascination on those outside the narrow orbit of classical study, perhaps especially on those who can best appreciate the pressures that Marcus himself faced. The Meditations was among the favorite readings of Frederick the Great. A recent American president has claimed to reread it every few years, but it has attracted others too, from poets like Pope, Goethe, and Arnold, to the southern planter William Alexander Percy who observed in his autobiography that there is left to each of us, no matter how far defeat pierces, the unassailable wintry kingdom of Marcus Aurelius. It is not outside, but within, and when all is lost, it stands fast. 
If Marcus has been studied less than many ancient authors, he has been translated more than most. But it has been a generation since his last English incarnation, and the time seems ripe for another attempt. My intention in what follows has been to represent in readable English both the content and the texture of the meditations. I have been especially concerned to convey the patchwork character of the original, both the epigrammatic concision that characterizes some entries and the straggling dis discursiveness of others. I hope the results will bear out my conviction that what a Roman emperor wrote long ago for his own use can still be meaningful to those far removed from him in time and space. We do not live in Marcus's world, but it is not as remote from us as we sometimes imagine. There could be no better witness to the effect of the meditations on a modern reader than the Russian poet Joseph Brodsky, whose essay, Homage to Marcus Aurelius, takes its departure from the famous statue of the emperor on the Capitoline Hill in Rome. I saw him for the last time a few years ago, on a wet winter night, in the company of a stray Dalmatian. I was returning by taxi to my hotel after one of the most disastrous evenings in my entire life. The next morning I was leaving Rome for the States. I was drunk. The traffic moved with the speed one wishes for one's funeral. At the foot of the capital, I asked the driver to stop, paid, and got out of the car. Presently I discovered I was not alone. A middle-sized Dalmatian appeared out of nowhere and quietly sat down a couple feet away. Its sudden presence was so oddly comforting that momentarily I felt like offering it one of my cigarettes. For a while we both stared at the horseman's statue, and suddenly, presumably because of the rain and the rhythmic pattern of Michelangelo's pilasters and arches, all got blurred, and against that blur the shining statue, devoid of any geometry, seemed to be moving not at great speed and not out of this place, but enough for the Dalmatian to leave my side and follow the bronze progress. Further reading. The standard modern biography of Marcus is A.R. Burley, Marcus Aurelius, 1966, Revised Edition, New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University Press, 1987, which makes full use of the principal ancient literary sources, not only the meditations, especially book one, but the remains of the history of Dio Cassius, the letters of Fronto, and the biography of Marcus in the so-called Historia Augusta. Burley also draws on recent research into the careers of upper-class office holders, prosopography, prosopography, and the workings of the imperial administration to paint a picture of Marcus's background and the society he moved in. The most comprehensive and reliable treatment of the Antoine Antonine Age can be found in the Cambridge Ancient History, Volume 11, The High Empire, A.D. 70 through 192, Cambridge University Press, 2000. Edward Gibbon's famous characterization of the period in the opening chapters of his History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire remain, remains well worth reading, although the picture it paints may be too rosy-colored. A useful counterbalance is E.R. Dodd's Pagan and Christian in an Age of Anxiety, Cambridge, England, Cambridge University Press, 1965, which offers a very different assessment of the period. Treatments of special topics abound, and only a few titles can be mentioned. The upper-class education that Marcus enjoyed is described by S.F. Bonner, Education in Ancient Rome, Berkeley, University of California Press, 1977. E. Champlin's Fronto and Antonine Rome, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press, 1980. And the best modern study of Marcus's teacher, Glenn Bowersox, Greek Sophists in the Roman Empire, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 1969, is a fundamental study of intellectual culture in the second century. Fergus Miller's The Emperor in the Roman World, Ithaca, New York, Cornell, University Press, 1977, is an exhaustive analysis of the civil and administrative functions performed by Marcus and his fellow emperors, complemented for military matters by J.B. Campbell's The Emperor and the Roman Army, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 1984. Most of the major ancient sources for Marcus and his world are conveniently printed with facing-page English translations in the Loeb Classical Library. The valuable but highly unreliable Life of Marcus in the Historia Augusta 
can be found in the three volumes of Scriptores Historiae Augustae, Trans D. Maggie, 1921 through 1932, as well as in A. Burley, Trans Lives of the Later Caesars, New York, Penguin, 1976. The Loeb series also includes the letters of Fronto, translation C.R. Haynes, two volumes, 1919, and of the historian Dio Cassius, translation E. Carey, nine volumes, 1914 through 1927, of which the last two are relevant to Marcus. Although composed and collected generation before Marcus's birth, the Letters of Pliny the Younger, translation Betty Radis, two volumes, 1969, are a rich and illuminating source for upper-class society in the mid-empire. Insight into the intellectual life of the period can be gained from Attic Nights of the Antiquarian Aulius Gilius, translation J.C. Rolfe, three volumes, 1927. The works of the satirist Lucian, translation A.M. Harmon, K. Kilburn, and M.D. MacLeod, eight volumes, 1913 through 1967, and Philostratus's Entertaining Lives of the Fo Sophists, translation W.C. Wright, 1921. Finally, mention should be made of two modern novels set in the Antonian period, Walter Pater's Marius the Epicurean, 1885, and Marguerite Yourcener's Memoirs of Hadrian, 1951. Neither should be mistaken for a primary source, but each is, in its different way, a masterpiece. Recent work on Hellenistic philosophy has done much to illuminate the philosophical background of the Meditations. A clear and helpful introduction to both Stoicism and Epicureanism can be found in A.A. A. Long, Hellenistic Philosophy, London, Duckworth, 1974, on a much larger scale in Kemp Algra, Jonathan Barnes, and Jop Monsfield, The Cambridge History of Hellenistic Philosophy, New York, Cambridge University Press, 1999. On Stoicism, see also F.H. Sandbach, The Stoics. London, Chateau and Windus, 1975, and J. Rist, Stoic Philosophy, Cambridge, England, Cambridge University Press, 1969. The works of the two most important Stoics, Zeno and Chrysippus, are largely lost. Their surviving fragments are translated in the first volume of A. A. Long and David Sedley, The Hellenistic Philosophers, New York, Cambridge University Press, 1987, which also includes much material on Epicureanism. An important source for the history of both schools is Diogenes, Laertius's Lives of the Philosophers, translation R. D. Hicks in the Loeb series, two volumes, 1925. For Stoicism under the Empire, the most important sources are the works of Seneca the Younger and Epictetus. The best introduction to Seneca is probably the Letters to Lucilius, of which a selection is available in Letters from a Stoic, translation R. Campbell, New York Penguin, 1969, Epictetus's Discourses and the Enchiridion are available in the Loeb series in a translation by W.A. Oldfather, two volumes, 1925. The Enchiridion has also been translated by T.W. Higginson, Indianapolis, Bob's Merrill, 1955. For the Meditations itself, the indispensable resource, though long out of print and difficult to obtain, is A.S.L. Farquharson's the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Antonius, two volumes, Oxford English, Oxford University Press, 1944. I have derived benefit from a number of earlier English translations, notably, notably those of Farquharson, recently reprinted with a new introduction by R.B. Rutherford, George Long, 1862, C.R. Haynes, Loeb, 1916, G.M.A. Grube, Indianapolis, Bob's Merrill, 1963, and Maxwell Staniforth, New York Penguin, 1964, as well as from W. Thaler's German translation, Zurich, Artemis, 1951, and the French edition of Book One by Pierre Hadot, Paris, Les Belles Letters, 1998. The best modern edition of the Greek text is that by J. Dolphin, 2nd edition, B.G. Tubner, 1987, though in vexed passages I have sometimes preferred different readings. Among scholarly studies of the Meditations, there in particular deserve mention P.A. Brunt, Marcus Aurelius in his Meditations, Germ um, Journal of Roman Studies, 64, 1974, 1 through 20, 
analyzes the themes that especially exercise Marcus. Pierre Hadot, The Inner Citadel, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, translation M. Chase, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press, 1998, is a thoughtful reconstruction of Marcus's philosophical system. R.B. Rutherford, The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, A Study, Oxford, England, Clarendon, 1989, is an excellent analysis from a more literary perspective with good remarks also on Marcus's relationship with the gods. Among the many appreciations by non-classists, two deserve special mention, Matthew Arnold's Marcus Aurelius, originally a review of Long's translation in his Lectures and Essays in Criticism, R.H. Super, Ann Arbor University of Michigan Press, 1962, and Joseph Brodsky's homage to Marcus Aurelius in his collection, On Grief and Reason, New York, Farrar, Strauss, and Giro, 1995.